thanks for the brief introduction. <laughs> and also, thank you to the uh, organizers for setting up this really nice conference and giving me the chance to speak about the story. Um, so I like to wrap up um, some work that a lot of people did, um, taking us from investigating uh, this funny little wheel problem towards a uh, question whether how we can apply it to um, circuit QED and to create a logical qubit with a geometrically controllable error rate. So the story um, would not have been possible with these guys. Um, it's a, 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 there has been a lot of analytical work that these guys were doing, especially I want to highlight Rhea and Leo, who, uh, well, did not became tired of doing pages of pages of pages of computation relation uh, computations. But I hope that in the end I can convince you that it was worth all the hassle. And um, for those of you who are short in time, we not only converted wheels into qubits, but also into QR codes. So that's our recent paper. If you want to leave earlier, you can just scan it. Hope the resolution is fine. OK. so. Even though this story is about wheels, um, I'm starting with a bump. So most probably one of uh, the most famous bumps in our community. Um, here, what you can see is um, the momentum density of rubidium atoms. Um, and it was the first um, experimental signature of a Bose-Einstein condensate forming uh, in an ultra-cold atom, uh, uh, in an ultra-cold gas of atoms. And so this, of course, you know, all know BECs, and it's a fascinating state of matter. And a lot of work has been done trying to understand um, what are the limitations, what are requirements to um, create this exotic state of matter. And especially the question arises, OK, how can we have lattice analogs of this BEC state? And one particular model where such a BEC was known to uh, form is this wheel system. Yeah, and there has been, I mean, if you just forget about the center side here, it's just a tight binding chain. Um, and you can imagine that in this 1D system, there is no true long range order possible. But once you include this coupling here and you make the coupling to the center side arbitrarily large, um, you will basically get a mean field like model. And in the, infinite, in the limit of infinite coordination number, it's very obvious that you would actually expect um, a Bose Einstein condensate. But the question is what happens in between? So what happens if you have a um, finite, uh, finite number of lattice sites? And that's what we actually um, started to investigate. And in the end, I tried to convince you that we believe that it's possible to realize that system using circuit QED elements and even more try to exploit its peculiar analytic properties to come up with a new logical qubit design. OK, so the system we are interested in uh, is this wheel. And so just some brief notation. Um, OK, the equations are missing. <laughs> OK, so up here is the wheel Hamiltonian. <laughs> Let me then maybe I just describe it. So we have, uh, we have basically hopping terms on this outer ring. Uh, we have a hopping amplitude t. And we have the center side here, which uh, constitutes an all-to-one coupling. So a particle sitting on the outer ring can hop via the center side to any other lattice side on the outer ring. Mm, we added some additional ingredient, namely a phase factor that particles can pick up once they hop uh, via the center side and then the outer ring back to its original uh, position. Um, this can be realized in practice, for instance, uh, by penetrating the wheel with a magnetic flux. And um, so in the following, we will consider hardcore bosons. Uh, so we put hardcore bosons on this lattice. Uh, hardcore bosons here means that we are considering the uh, infinite repulsion limit of uh, the bose hubbard wheel. So hopping of a particle to another lattice site where already a particle resides is energetically forbidden. <coughs> so since uh, even though dou double occupations in real space are forbidden, this changes in momentum space. Because hardcore bosons, once transformed into momentum space, lose their hardcore property. Mm, and, well, since that's just a, a Hamiltonian which is quadratic in the hardcore bosonic operators, it's tempting to di diagonalize this quadratic model. Um, and you can do this. 
And if you do this, you get the single particle dispersion relation. Yeah, it's just a normal cosine band. It's flipped compared to what, is what you know from tight binding chains because there's another sign which you cannot see. <laughs> um, but um, we have this additional center side. And this additional center side now adds some additional flavor to the system. So what happens is that there is one specific single particle mode on the outer ring, which is characterized exactly by this phase K null. Um, and only this mode can couple to the, uh, to the center side. Uh, and if that happens, then um, or you, can come, uh, you can write down superposition of these two states uh, in a single particle subspace, and you will obtain two more eigenstates. Yeah, um, one eigenstate is labeled here, and the other one is labeled there. And if you now vary this flux k null, you can basically shift the position where these single particle eigenstates split away from the tight binding dispersion relation. <coughs> um, and now the funny thing is, if you tune up, or if you are able to move this state energetically below every other single particle state in the tight binding um, dispersion relation, it's very natural to expect that bosons can condense into that state, right, and form a BEC. So that's the underlying idea of um, why or how to think of the, the wheel, why it can exhibit Bose-Einstein condensation. And now the question is, uh, how does this geometric stabilization work? Mm. Again, here's the equation missing. So um, if you compute the single particle energies of these two eigenstates, um, what you realize is that the energetic separation scales with S, okay, that's the coupling to the center side, but it also scales with the square root of the coordination number of the uh, lattice sites on the outer ring. So this means if you just crank up the number of lattice sites here, this state will be pushed down energetically, um, <coughs> and by that you can obtain very stable condensation, right, because you have a huge energy gap. The interesting thing is, um, this translates also to the many-body case. And now here, the thing is, that it's a hardcore bosonic model, so um, if you want to use the usual approach to solve the many-body problem by your Wigner transformation, the all-to-one coupling with the center side basically screws up your analytics. You get density-density interactions of an arbitrary uh, <coughs> range, so your Wigner transformation by itself is not working, but um, we managed to come up with a solution strategy which in the limit of large, effective, renormalized ring-to-center hopping, as tilde, let's call it as tilde for now, um, for large as tilde, we can actually obtain the many-body spectrum. Yeah. And here you can see um, an excerpt of the many-body spectrum, um, and the really uh, important point here is that this many-body spectrum exhibits a clustered structure. Yeah? For each value of S, if you make S large enough, for instance, um, you see three clusters of many-body eigenstates forming. The states in the center here, they correspond to basically single particle states being occupied on the outer ring. Um, the cluster, which is going down energetically, and the other one green here going up. These are many-body eigenstates where the hybridization, or where modes hybridizing the outer ring and the center side, so exactly this mode or this mode are occupied. And if you then crank up <coughs> as tilde, you can separate these modes, uh, these eigenstates. And, okay, since we have the many-body spectrum, we can, of course, also compute observables. We computed, for instance, the um, particle number, and we realized, okay, these states um, show an extensive number, uh, an extensively scaling occupation number, so they do actually realize condensation. And it's not only one state, but it's a whole bulk of many-body states. Uh, you can see it here in the inset. Um, so this energetic separation now kind of suggests that the, these states should be very robust against perturbations. So we added nearest neighbor density-density interactions. Should be there. <laughs> um, and so these density-density interactions now couple sides on the outer ring. And um, so here you can see the, uh, a finite size extrapolation of the occupation of the ground state. And it's normalized to the maximum possible occupation number. And you can see once we crank up the number of lattice sites, so we increase S tilde, we always get a finite uh, condensate fraction. So the BEC is actually stable in the presence of very strong interactions here. 
And a similar thing can be observed here, but now for a finite number of lattice sites. So these computations were done using DMRG because now with density-density interactions, uh, our solution strategy is not working anymore. But I think the main, the main point, namely that you get a very robust, exotic quantum many-body state um, stabilized by increasing the coordination number, for instance, um, should become clear. Okay, so this is, really, this is really interesting because it tells us we now have a mechanism to generate uh, um, a protection, an energetic protection of a highly, um, normally highly fragile quantum many-body state, and we were wondering how can we realize this experimentally. So we went to our friends um, at Schellingstraße, and they told us, well, ultra-code atoms may have some problems um, creating this homogeneous all-to-one coupling. So we had to think about um, other situations where such an all-to-one coupling could be realized. And we realized rather quickly, well, there are setups where this happens naturally, namely in so-called circuit QED uh, setups. Um, you have a waveguide, which acts as a basically um, a resonator, and you can couple superconducting qubits, for instance, capacit capacitively to this waveguide, and not only one qubit, but several qubits. Uh, so this is now the setup that we propose. Yeah, we, have a, we have a cavity, and we, uh, we couple to this cavity superconducting qubits. For the sake of completeness, we also took into consideration now the hopping along the outer ring of our wheel, but for the following discussion, this hopping amplitude of T is not that important. Um, however, if you want to take this to actual labs, of course, additional error sources pop up. And that was then a question that we had to address a little bit carefully. So um, one big problem of um, coupling superconducting qubits to a cavity is that um, it's, or well, at least that's what our experimental friends told us, it's hard to homogeneously couple many qubits to one cavity, especially if you want to have a um, strong coupling limit. <coughs> But I mean, for us, that's okay. All we need to do is, uh, uh, theoretically, we just introduce perturbations, right? Um, the point here is now, even though we have shown that this separation of the many-body clusters from each other by scaling up the no coordination number um, can protect the many-body spectrum when it happens on the outer ring, the question is still what happens if we actually perturb these extensively many couplings. And it, we were a little bit afraid that this will destroy this protection mechanism. So we did a lot, lot of an analytical computations. And since we are now losing the translational symmetry of our wheel um, because of these random couplings here, um, solving the single particle problem is not possible anymore, but you can derive bounds. And what you can see here are, uh, is the single particle spectrum. And again, we find two modes separating from the bulk of the um, single particle spectrum. The separation is again proportional to the renormalized hopping uh, amplitude. And if you average over these bounds, uh, if you average these bounds over disorder realizations, then you figure out, okay, the corrections occurring um, if we consider random perturbations, are second order in the standard deviation of these perturbations. So that was really good news, and to illustrate this, you can, um, we also ex uh, explicitly solved a single particle problem for a couple of thousand disorder realizations, and here you can see the distribution of the, many body I uh, of the single particle eigenstates, and if you look at the energy scales here, scattering around the exact unperturbed single particle eigenvalue, they are very narrow. So we reobtain the single particle spectrum to a very high precision. The cool thing is this also translates into the many-body case. Now, I'm not showing you the spectrum there um, because to proceed, but um, you can do a similar averaging procedure. Um, and yeah, you find out that also um, the many-body spectrum only picks up cor uh, corrections which are second order in the standard deviation of the perturbations. <coughs> So that's really good news for us because it tells us, okay, the main error source could be controlled. Um, and now I promised you that we want to take wheels to qubits. 
So the question is, how can we make a logical qubit out of this? And there's one ingredient missing, in our opinion. Namely, we need to be able to store and read out information from that system. And one way to do this is to add another control qubit. And in the following, I want to show you how this, uh, the properties of that system and how one can also implement a single site, a single X gate on this system. Okay, now we have an equation. This is the Bose Hubbard wheel Hamiltonian, <laughs> which you hopefully can imagine. Um, and we are now adding, um, coupling uh, the control qubit. And we, do, uh, we also introduce a frequency detuning of the control qubit. Yeah. <clears throat> this can be implemented uh, theoretically by a chemical potential. And due to this frequency detuning, we would most probably um, can practically also only realize very small couplings between the cavity and the control qubit. But that's okay. So for now, we're working in the limit where this control qubit is coupled very weakly to the cavity and it's frequency detuned. We applied the same solution strategy from the wheel to, the, to this system. And the good news is we get basically the same many-body structure uh, um, compared to the one from the wheel uh, system. Yeah? So we get three clusters of many-body states, and they seem to separate nicely once you crank up um, the effective hopping to the cavity. But this control qubit um, introduces a second set of these clusters. And the interesting thing is, varying the chemical potential, these clusters are shifted against each other. Um, and if you now look at this small portion of the many-body spectrum, you can suddenly see clusters of many-body eigenstates popping up. Um, they are color-coded here, and the color coding basically should tell you that they have similar properties physically, and this is the basis for our logical qubit suggestion. Okay, let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So first of all, as I already told you, we see the same energetically separation of these clusters from the remaining part of the many-body spectrum by cranking up the number of lattice sites on the outer ring. We then call them stabilizer qubits. Um, and also, the splitting of these, two st um, of these clusters here, this is now controlled by the chemical potential. Um, or the frequency detuning of the control qubit. And what then happens if, if you measure the occupation of these two clusters, they um, turn out to have the very nice property that any many-body many, uh, many eigenstate in that cluster has vanishing occupation of the control qubit up to second-order corrections in the coupling between cavity and control qubit, which is small, so this is even smaller. Um, and if you are in that cluster, then the control qubit is occupied with the same very small corrections. So that would constitute now a readout mechanism to actually, um, actually identify the, um, whether, our control, uh, whether our whole system is either in that bulk, um, uh, in that cluster of many-body eigenstates or in that cluster of many-body eigenstates. Um, and for now, this cluster we call logical zero state and that the logical one state. Maybe one short comment on the number of states in these clusters. Um, they scale exponentially with the coordination number, so there is a huge redundancy in encoding this information. <coughs> okay, so having set up um, the logical qubit, now finally the question is, can we also implement operations on that qubit? So um, the idea is to just act on the control qubit with an, uh, with an excitation. And we performed uh, computations by preparing the whole system at a finite temperature state, and then we evaluated the effect of you know, exciting the control qubit. And we computed um, the fidelity of that operation by just um, um, evaluating the probability to end up in this blue bulk of many-body eigenstates, which we identify with a logical one state. So this X-gate fidelity here um, is shown for one choice of the uh, frequency detuning as a function of the temperature. And you can see that we can reach fidelity, so these are the error rates, so it's one minus fidelity. We can reach fidelities at 15 Kelvin 
are, which are smaller than 10 to the minus 2, and if you go to even 10 millikelvin, they drop below 10 to the minus 4. The color coding, uh, the, the color shading here, corresponds to the different number of control qubits, uh, of stabilizer qubits. So that means if you give me your, a setup and you say, okay, I can implement a certain coupling between my qubits and the cavity, and I want a certain single qubit fidelity, we can ex exactly tell you how many stabilizer qubits you need to actually achieve um, this fidelity given a, given a certain experimental uh, limitation on the coupling strength. Yeah? Um, and in order to push the system a little bit, we asked our experimental friends what could be limits for the frequency detuning and also for, um, for the coupling strength between stabilizer qubits and cavity. And they gave us these numbers. So we redid the computation now with a frequency detuning of 17 gigahertz. And here you see the 20 uh, stabilizer qubit line. And following that line, um, we arrive at um, error rates, which are nearly of the order of 10 to the minus 5. And in the inset, you can see another way to think of this um, namely in terms of geometric stabilization. So what happens if you crank up the number of stabilizer qubits fixing a certain coupling strength S? Well, it just takes you down this plot, right? And for each temperature, you will then get a different error rate and cranking up the number of stabilizer qubits um, allows you to reduce the error rate nearly by two orders of magnitude if you are in the lowest temperature regimes. Okay, so with that, I think um, I'm done so far. So our idea still is like a theoretical proposal, but we believe that it should be possible to realize such a circuit QED realization of the um, hardcore bosonic bose hubbard wheel. And maybe one side comment, it must not be implemented as a qubit. You can also forget about the control qubit and just try to realize a setup where you can uh, where you can detect Bose-Einstein condensation. The whole stabilization mechanism is, of course, independent on whether you add this control qubit or not. So we do also expect this system to be a maybe potential candidate to realize Bose-Einstein condensation on a lattice system at temperatures of 20, 30 millikelvins. And thank you for your attention. And there is, again, a wheel. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, in order to get something like universal quantum computer, you would have to use two qubit gates at some point. Do you have an idea how to realize something like that with that setting? Yeah, so um, the single qubit gate operations here rely on the fact that you can actually flip uh, the, the state of superconducting qubits. So in that sense, once you can implement the single qubit operation via only acting on the control qubit, it should be straightforward to generalize this to two qubit gates. So in the sense, the error rate that we were computing here gives you an upper bound on the actual two qubit error rate. More questions? Okay, then maybe. If nobody else wants to, then I go. Um, do you have a feeling or kind of a comparison to what you could do with 20 qubits if you would do another surface, like another code, like a surface code or so with them, like which fidelities you would reach then with a similar setup? Because, well, mm -hmm. if you're proposing a kind of an error correction code, you have kind of LDPC codes, um, kind of the whole zoo of other codes that you're competing against. So, I mean, I think at least for, so I'm not an expert on these, uh, on these uh, other error correction codes, but I think for a single qubit gate reaching a fidelity of 10 to the minus, or 1 minus 10 to the minus 5 is already at the order of what, or yeah, is maybe the limiting cases of the other. So we are definitely in, the, um, in, the, in, in, in a regime where we can compete with the other cor um, error correction codes. Um, I don't have exact numbers. So you mentioned that you thought about trying to, whether it was possible to implement this also on the neutral atom platform. And can you elaborate a little bit of why, for example, 
single atom in opt optical tweezers in a cavity would not be a viable Oh, uh, so uh, that, sorry for, um, for not being precise enough. So we were uh, talking uh, about trapped ions back then, um, um, trapped ion platforms um, in optical lattices. And Monica told us that having this all-to-one coupling is kind of a complicated task that because they can create square lattice-like geometries, maybe triangular lattice-like geometries, but cranking up the number of lattice sites while having a homogeneous coupling to one side. Um, that turned out to be a problem. I don't know about optical tweezers, actually. So if any one of you has an idea, I'd be happy to discuss, actually, because the more we learn about how to realize the system, I guess the more, uh, the higher are the chances to actually see an implementation in a practical. Okay, so then I would also like to ask a question. Um, if you have your condensate states, I, it, it seems to me that the phase must be extremely well defined. Can, can you make use of, have you analyzed like the properties of this phase and could you like use it, <coughs> like maybe Josephson junction like? That's a good idea. So yeah, you actually have a, have, um, so in, in the infinite system size limit, you have a sharp phase because then it's just a mean field. Uh, you can I solve mean, your, your whole model is very close to mean fields. Yes, um, and for the finite, um, for the finite uh, le uh, number of lattice sites, um, you have a very sharp phase. Um, it's and you can also tune the uh, tune this right by changing um, the flux penetrating the wheel. So what actually what we thought about is that it could also be used to kind of uh, to interfere um, or uh, to Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, by considering superpositions of two wave vectors. So yeah, there's still much more to explore using this um, phase dependence. Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank